And stage three, we have desires and we know that our faithfulness to the present moment is the only thing that's relevant. We know in our bones that the outcomes are not up to us. And the only thing that's up to us is the moment by moment choosing to be present, to elevate our being by inhabiting our body and our hearts. The episode on the two stages of healing was really popular. I was surprised how popular. Little bit concerned how popular, as I'll say, I have two minds about it and some refinements to add. And also in this episode, we're going to talk about the third stage. So to review, the first stage of healing is I'm in pain, fix me. I'm looking for relief from my pain and I'm looking for an external outcome. Health, love, money. I wanted a baby. It's those types of things. This is a really important phase because it calls us into healing. And it's where we gain awareness and we start to understand ourselves better. But we do plateau and get frustrated because when you're trying to change life, it can feel like banging your head against a wall because you're trying to make it into something it's not. And so it's not super... Uh, enjoyable and gets really frustrating after a while. So then we move into stage two, which is accessing our own wisdom. It's a much more aware, grounded state that says, okay, so I can see that I'm not showing up as I'd like to show up. And I can also see that there's a reason for that. And it's not totally in my control. And I would like to do some healing around that so that I can show up differently. And that healing is usually multi-leveled, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Now, the popularity of this episode is a double-edged sword because I know that we all want to fit ourselves into a stage, and I'm going to think of other words for it because stage is not quite right. It's very patriarchal. It's very hierarchical. It's very um, what's better. And I'm going to give some refinements here, but I want to say it is not about what's better. The reason we're doing this is the stages help us open ourselves to what's possible by having a conception that something else is possible. So one of the refinements is it's not actually a ladder up, one, two, three. It's a cycle. So it's fix me, fix me. Okay, so I'm going to work with this energy. So in my case, it was I want to have a baby. I'll do anything. Moving into, okay, I'm going to work with this desire to open my heart and love and this passion that's been evoked in me. And then we'll get to the third stage, which we'll talk about. And then life will bring us back to the first in another way. And this is the other refinement that there are, we are all in stage one when we're super triggered. For example, I had a difficult day the other day when um, my dog needed surgery potentially. She, she's fine. And um, uh, my car needed new tires. And the total cost I had not planned for. And I was scared. And so I reached out to somebody that I trust to talk through the car issue because sometimes I don't totally understand what they're saying at the dealership, which I don't think is entirely me, but that's a whole other story. And because I was so scared and surprised and shocked, I reached out for somebody else's point of view. I was in the fix me. I was in the save me place in that moment. There's nothing wrong with it. I was triggered. And we all get to that and we need that kind of comfort. And 
this person was very helpful and had points of view. That's why I reached out to them. And also he said to me, he said, just remember you're well loved, which was really the point that I was looking for comfort. So whenever we're triggered, we go back to that number one. And this can be in bigger ways too. When life throws us really big challenges, like a health diagnosis, we go right to one. We're terrified and we need help and we look for help. And this this is a, a natural part of our growth. So there's no knock on being in an earlier stage. And we're all always going through them, both in time and in other areas of our life. So, you know, you could say that I have areas of my life that are very much stage one, areas of my life that are stage two, and areas that are, I hope, moving into stage three. And it's not so straightforward as that, but you can kind of start to see how things are moving. So let's talk about stage three. Stage three is really an amplified stage two. Stage three is surrender. It's letting it all go. So in stage two, we've stopped fixating on the external outcome. In stage three, the external outcome is beside the point. The only point in this stage is the present moment and our relationship to it. In stage three, we don't tell other people, let it go, or everything happens for a reason. That's not stage three. Stage three is not in the mind. You can't think yourself into stage three. In stage three, we empathize with everybody right where they are because we also know pain. And we also experience pain. We honor the discomfort and we're not fighting any piece of our experience or any piece of life. Now, you can't skip stages. You have to gain the agency and the wisdom before you can let go of it. And this is the shadow side that you can see in different areas of life where people will say, Everything happens for a reason. Let it go, love and light. But they haven't actually felt the heartbreak that it takes to be able to say, let it go. Because let it go is not saying, I do not feel pain. Surrender is not saying, life is easy. Surrender is accepting all of the feelings and experiences as part of life and calls into depth. In stage three, we still have desires. We still have things like, oh, I would love to fall in love again. But the outcomes do not determine us, and we don't spend time trying to make the outcomes happen. That's the thing. In stage two, we are working towards outcomes. We're cleaning up. In stage three, We have desires and we know that our faithfulness to the present moment is the only thing that's relevant. We know in our bones that the outcomes are not up to us. And the only thing that's up to us is the moment by moment choosing to be present, to elevate our being by inhabiting our body and our heart. In stage three, we will never betray the present moment for the sake of something we think we should do, something we think someone else needs, something we want in the future. We never betray the present moment, ever. This is a paradox that has to be worked out in life. For example... You might say to me, as I have said over time, but I have things to do. And one of the things I notice is that when I stay present, Rose still gets fed. What's important happens out of care. 
And it doesn't mean we don't plan ahead. We do. But it slows way down. And it happens very easily and naturally. We are not overwhelmed by ideas, plans, to-do lists, thoughts. In stage three, we do not even entertain voices that don't fit with our energy. So we're not scrolling, allowing things to come into us that, that aren't helpful for us. We very easily see what feeds us and what doesn't, and only what feeds us is present. Or do we allow to be present? And we don't give up our own energy for anything because our own energy is divine. Our own energy is what amplifies the world. We are part of the universal field. And us giving away our energy is a betrayal of God. Take that one in. Mull that one for a little bit and see how that sits for you. I'll give you another example from the dealership. That was a very fruitful trip to the dealership. Someone, I was at my laptop and I had a book and I was writing. I was preparing a talk I was giving. And a guy came up to me and he said, are you a student? I, this, is, this, this always gets my goat to no end. Do I look like a schoolgirl? I'm 47 years old. Least could you think I was the teacher? But anyway, <laughs> he was in his own world. He, and he wasn't saying, hi, how are you? He was wanting to bring his own story to me. And so I, I looked at him. I smiled. And I didn't say anything. And I considered this a huge success for me because I didn't have that default fear place. Oh, I better make him happy. I better give him what he wants. I stayed with my energy, which was important to me. What I was creating and working on was important. I had an open heart and I looked at him and I smiled, but I didn't engage. And it's that embodied prioritization of our own energy that is really what we're going for in stage three, even though we're not consciously going for it. And I'm going to say more about that in a second. So the only measurement, if there is any measurement in stage three, is the present moment, connected to love, available. Everything else is secondary. We trust, we have faith that love will work itself out. And... A lot of us have quite catastrophic fears that motivate us and that keep our worry going. So we worry about homelessness. We worry about getting sick. We worry about things happening to people that we love. And we worry about being alone. These are four things that we worry about a lot. In stage three, even though those thoughts will definitely come, we're, we're totally human. What's possible is to know in our bones that, that even sick, even homeless, we are loved and we are love. That we have an embodied sense of the richness that we are more and more experiencing in our day-to-day -day life that cannot be taken away. It's a really fascinating um, inquiry and evolution to watch ourselves grapple with what is really important. And what's really important is our present moment aliveness. And without it, we have nothing. And with it, we have everything. And that's an inquiry. That's, these are all inquiries. Like I said, you can't think your way into stage three. It is a process that we are all in, I'm in it, we're all in it. Daily practice is the foundation of stage three. It's the, it's the motivator, and it becomes a moment-by-moment -moment practice. It moves from, I'm going to do this because I want this, which is a little stage one, but it's also stage two. Like, 
It's like, I'm practicing so that I get this, so that I become this. The practice is actually every day, all day. And the formal practice is precious and the heart of the matter. It's the juicy part of the day. It's not about a checklist at all. It's about our inner state. In stage two, we may still be aware of stuff to work through. We may notice like, oh boy, like I really don't have confidence here. I really, you know, I have some healing to do in this area. And we may seek out deep healing for particular things we're working through. And most of us have a stage two area in our life where we would like to go deeper. Maybe it's sexuality. Maybe it's our relationship with our partner and the intimacy. Maybe it's our work in the world. We all have this area. Maybe it, maybe it is anxiety that or a lifestyle habit where we want to grow. Most of us have that stage two area. The question is when it moves from stage two to stage three, which is a deeper embodiment of ourselves without the um, focus on the problem. So paradoxical. Language is so hard in this. Also, And this is to support what I said at the beginning about the wheel. Moving from stage two to stage three is also part of the life cycle. So we're always moving through it in different areas of our life, on different days, in different seasons of our life, and then in the life cycle as well. Stage three is when we are no longer creating in the world in such a, okay, now I'm going to scare myself and do this new thing. I'm like, this is a new thing, and then this is a new thing, and then this is... It's, it's those later years when being becomes so much more important, when being is the creation. And I see this very much in some of the prayer groups I'm in, the, the feeling quality of people who have been meditating for years and are at the stage in their life cycle where their being is, is so clarified. Stage two is creation. Stage three is release. Challenges in life are what call us into doing this work of moving between the stages. And this is why challenges are so good and why sometimes we choose challenges because they call us into our growth as beings. Here's another metaphor for stage three. How do you have a better orgasm? Or on the flip side, what is the clear way to ruin your orgasm? The clear way to ruin it is to think, is it coming? Is it coming? And this isn't going to be a good one. Is this going to be a good one? What's going to happen? Is this good? Takes away from it, right? The pressure takes away from the enjoyment. The way to have a good orgasm is to, ah, have it without any thought. This one is this one. It looks like this, you know? And so that's stage three. It's not, is this good? Is this good? Am I healing? Am I better? How is this? Is, am I going to be okay? Am I getting too old for this? Da, da, da. None of that. It's just like, here we go. Oh, that feels good. Oh, that's a little strange. Mm, that's a bit much. Oh, oh, here we are. Oh. That's stage three. It's like, just like, whoa, letting it all happen. Letting it all happen. Letting go and having life. So a reminder, you can't bypass the stages. There's a very famous psychoanalytic paper called Masochism, Submission, and Surrender by Emmanuel Gant. It's so good. And he talks about submission versus surrender. And this is really the difference between bypassing and allowing yourself to go through it. If you bypass, you submit, which means some part of you kind of dies. You crack. And you're not alive. 
You're like, oh, this is how it has to be. I have to let it all go. To be a good meditator, to be a good spiritual person, I have to let it go. I have to be okay with how everything is. I have to be calm. So I'm going to be very calm. Nothing bothers me. It's that kind of thing, which is very dissociated from our aliveness. Surrender, on the other hand, feels it all. Surrender is juicy and alive, and it's a big wave to ride. It's not necessarily oh so calm. For some people it is, certainly for some people. I am not one of those people. We get to have all our feelings. We get to have all the experiences and thoughts come to us and do, 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 and it, it all happens. That's surrender. It's not trying to make ourselves anything. You can't put yourself into a stage. You can't do it. So then you might want to know, what can you do? If you can't put yourself in a stage, what can you do? And this is really, this is the heart of the matter here. Grace is right in front of us. And all we have to do is create the conditions to experience the grace of being alive. That's all. It's so simple when it happens. And we spend so much time. uh, uh, I'm going to do affirmations. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The decades, the years of trying to feel better. It's really moving. And it's an honest part of our growth. And then when we get to the other side, it feels so good. So what can we do to create the conditions for grace? To create the conditions for ourselves to heal, for our nervous systems to relax and to reconnect and with who we really are? Well, number one is daily contemplative practice. This can look like so many things. I encourage as much silence as you can muster in that practice. Even two to five minutes of silent, open meditation, sensing your aliveness in your body and allowing spirit to speak. The daily practice is the number one thing I see as a differentiator for people in terms of shit shifting themselves into the place of connection to themselves that they're longing for. Another related thing is intentional prioritization of yourself and your contemplative life. And this does not mean ours. This means the prioritization. So of all the things that happen in the day, no matter how busy you are, What things are not as important as your connection with yourself? This means time, energy, attention, money, all of the ways that we show what matters to us. And the more we prioritize ourselves, the more all those other things that seem so busy go away. It really is shocking. It's really amazing. Um, And the easier, the things that can't go away, like the daily responsibilities and the must-dos, the easier they become. It's a paradox. It's an amazing paradox to work with. And I really encourage you to try it out. Another thing that you can do to help yourself move through the stages is be aware of your focus. This is related to prioritization. It's related to your contemplative practice. But where is your focus going moment to moment? And there's always room for us to have another layer of clarifying our focus. Whether it's scrolling social media, reading the news, being distracted by people's problems and things that they need from us, but really saying to ourselves, I'm going to take in, just like I would watch what I eat, I'm going to watch what comes into my mind, my heart, my spirit, and I'm going to focus on what is deep and what is expansive. Related to that is what environments are you putting yourself in? 
What communities are you in? We do this work in community. And being in an environment where other people are valuing these types of questions and holding them is essential to us grounding in the questions ourselves. We learn and grow together, and we need environments where our way of being is honored so that we feel that resonant field. We feel that amplification of who we are. Another way to move between the stages is to cultivate self-compassion exactly as you are. Paradox again. Everything's a paradox in, uh, in this kind of wisdom work. It's self-compassion for where you exactly are, as much as you possibly can muster, as much as you would have for a child in your care. You have for yourself exactly as you are, even in your deepest, darkest, bad habits, and whatever. Love yourself right where you are and act from that place. Because automatically when you're doing that, you're all the way over into stage three because you're allowing yourself, you're not fighting life. Finally, there are modalities that help. And do I dare call medicine work a modality? Well, it is a kind of modality. It is a way of working. And there are many of them. Chinese medicine, various herbs, supplements, working with medicines of the earth, various energy healings. There are things that can help heal our nervous system, restore balance, give us access to our divinity. And these are valuable endeavors. And for myself, have been in, in, invaluable in the context of understanding what we're up to here. Like, why are we doing this? And with that intention, all of those pieces of the puzzle can be extremely useful. The contemplative practice, the putting yourself in communities that support you, the medicine work, the Chinese medicine, all of the things are supportive within the intention. And your intention is yours. I suspect it's somewhat related to connecting to you in your essence on an ongoing basis and feeling that juicy aliveness. Medicine work is particularly good for taking us through the stages and helping us not resist but allow things to happen and to support us to come into being rather than doing. I love to support people who are stepping into stage two and maybe peeking at stage three and saying, oh my gosh, like there's more here. The thing that I'm going through, I can see how it's connected to more. And I want to do that work so that I can show up in my fullness and love myself and let that overflow into the world. Those are the people I love to work with. This is my life. This is the territory I walk every single day. And if you'd like to talk further about working together, I would love to talk to you. Check out my offerings page, allisoncrossway.com slash offerings and see what appeals and then be in touch and we can talk.